So hello everybody. This is the first uh, um, issue refinement session for the static site editor that I'm hosting. Um, I was just about to tell the team that uh, the session is totally optional. It should not be seen as a synchronous team meeting. This is one of those that's in our team calendar. And if you're available and if you're particularly interested in the issues that I'll be focusing on refining uh, in the session, um, you're more than welcome to join and collaborate with me on it. Um, so this is an open session. It's a pairing session for anybody that's, that wants to, to add their uh, input and value to the conversation. Um, I will record these. And um, the, what, one, of, one of the, the kind of like triggers for the session was when we had a, a bit of a collaboration uh, in our, uh, I think it's the last, last week's uh, um, group sync around the um, editable front matter. Uh, and it was good to get everybody else's thoughts and inputs. And, uh, you know, considering that synchronous time is expensive, uh, we need to, whenever we have the opportunity to use that, we should use it for value. Um, the other one is also just as a forcing function for me to to uh, get better at issue refinement and, and cleaning up issues and epics. Um, having it in my calendar uh, makes it a little bit more real and authoritative to that it's something I have to do for some reason. So uh, it's a bit of a life hack for me to get better at these as well. Um, but I am very happy to uh, have you all on the call with me today. So. As posted in the in the Slack channel, the the three kind of like main things I want to look at uh, today. I don't know if I'll get to all of them, but um, the first one is fleshing out the, some further considerations for implementing the static site editor configuration file. So we know that's a, a blocker for the image uploads right now, um, and we also know that down the line for editable front matter, we will definitely uh, need. Um, configuration options to to really drive our um, you know our, our vision of what we want that feature to look like going forward then the second one is to um, clean up the um, the reduce www.gitlab.com repo size uh, epic and its related issues so um, related to I won't, I won't make the, con the, the official connection, but it, there could be a relation to the merge trains uh, you know, getting stuck last week so much. And the fact that uh, you know, we had some high utilization on the Gitly nodes um, related to the repo size. Uh, Chad had a look at the, the issue that was reported and request to the clone, uh, the cap to clone um, the GitLab, uh, the dubbed up GitLab com repo so that we have less clones of that repo as we do builds um, and stuff. Um, but what he, he made some good points yesterday that, you know, we haven't changed anything drastically in, in the, the repo. What is, what is kind of like causing things to, to fall over now? Um, and one of, one of the things that we've known we need to look at for a long time, but we put on the back burner because of the mono repo restructure was uh, you know, reducing the, the size of that repo. So um, I wanna have a look at that. And then lastly, um, uh, one of our, our kind of like secondary objectives in this milestone is to, to look at converting the, the GitLab handbook from middleman to frontman. And there is some kind of like prerequisite uh, steps that we need to do. So there's two uh, custom extensions that we wrote for, for the handbook that we need to uh, convert to the helpers uh, because Frontman doesn't have uh, custom extensions, but they do have helpers. Um, and so um, I wanna have a, uh, have a crack at the fire, uh, creating and converting that issue to an epic and then the finding some issues follow. Um, welcome, Michael. Um, I just mentioned, uh, I'll recap quickly for your sake. I mentioned earlier to the team that this is not, this should not be seen as a synchronous uh, call. It should be seen as a, a, a open sparing opportunity. If you have the time, if you are awake, if you are interested in whatever gets touched on uh, in the session, feel free to join and collaborate. Um, so yeah. Sean, maybe you mentioned it and I missed. Uh, are you going over a doc or a board or a list no. somewhere? Um, I, I, 
um, as part of the process that we defined on our handbook page, Enrique kindly suggested we should do like a, a, a heads up 24 hours ahead of the time for the team, you know, what we want to cover in the sessions. Um, I was a little bit late to, to that uh, today. Um, well, yesterday I didn't get to posting that. So I, I, I essentially, I looked at, you know, what are the, the things that are high priority to look at? I see it now. You put it in Slack. I missed that. Ah, there we go. Cool. Um, yeah, so I do, I would like to, to get a little bit more predictable in terms of this, but I can also clear, uh, easily see it being whatever is top of mind uh, the day or two before the session. So also, I, I would like to uh, open up this that, um, anybody who has an issue that they would like to, uh, you know, refine a bit further can suggest uh, an issue or an epic to look at. You know, this is not just me doing it. Um, so this is, this is your team session and, you know, I don't even have to run this session. All right. With that said, uh, out of those three, implementing the static side and configuration file, reducing the GitLab com repo size and migrating the GitLab handbook from middleman to frontman. Is there any preference to which one we start? Anybody have a specific interest in, in any one of them? Chad, you're kind of like linked to all three, so your, your vote doesn't count. Right. Configuration file? Yeah, configuration yeah, file. Only for that one. Okay, well, there we go. Configuration file it is. So I'm going to share my screen and just get to machine. Can you all see my uh, browser screen? Good enough. Yes. Awesome. Uh, I will, however, make it a little bigger. And then we'll zoom in a bit. Just for the recording sake. All right. So let's take a step back. <laughs> The problem we need to solve, you know, we need to accommodate various static site generators and project customization. Um, um, geez, I wrote this badly. It is important for, yeah. So to accommodate various static site generators and project customization is important that, uh, you know, we have the static site editor uh, feature needs to have a understanding of the environment that the, uh, that the project is configured in. Um, you know, our, our strategy has always been to use a kind of like convention over configuration approach um, to say that, you know, we'll use sensible defaults and where needed, we'll expose those defaults to, to configuration for the user to override. Um, we held off as long as we can on this. Um, you know, Vasily actually did the initial R&D on this uh, many moons ago, you know, three months ago, actually, uh, where he had a look at these things. Um, and we said we would hold off on, on it as long as we, we could. But we have now reached that point where we need to, um, to really kind of like um, get it in place. And, you know, pretty much the, the problems we need to solve, you know, it, and, and it's very much the persona is probably a software developer with development team lead. You know, and, and I phrase it as a software developer uh, I want to override the static site editor's default configuration so I can ensure it works correctly with my project structure. Um, we know, for instance, that the handbook uh, itself has a specific structure and it's in a mono repo structure. And, and so just out of the bat, that could be kind of like a fairly different to what you, know, you would have a, if you have a single repo with a project in it uh, out of the box. And then also as a software developer, I want to override the static site editor's default configuration so I can customize the behavior of the static site editor. Um, down the line, I can totally see you know, us being able to specify which uh, formatting options is available in the toolbar, you know, which headings. You know, maybe, you, maybe you never want somebody to be able to choose an H1 because from, from an ACO point of view, you, know, you should only have one H1 on a page uh, most of the time. Um, you know, there's, there's caveats to that, but, uh, you know, so essentially down the line, as we want to move to a more mature or lovable, uh, maturity level for our feature, you know, we'd want to bring in more configuration options and the ability for somebody to, to customize it. So 
the the obvious kind of like way to do that would be through a configuration file. Now, the user experience goals. So, out of can the, I, the can yeah. I talk a little bit about the persona? Yeah, sure, go for it. So, one of the things that I've brought up frequently, and it came up in the meeting yesterday, is as being a software developer persona, there's things, for example, I want to be able to edit the raw markdown, regardless of how good you make the WYSIWYG experience or make a, a, a front matter editing form, like because that's the most efficient way. And I looked at the, the Sasha software developer persona, and it doesn't seem like there's anything that gets directly at that, even though I feel that's a common concern. The last one, which is I'm concerned that by taking longer than expected on the task, I may be judged or seen as blocking others' work, but that's not really it. And I feel like maybe that's something missing from the persona because I feel like that would, that's sort of a common concern of a lot of software developers. Like don't get in my way, let me get to the raw source code and do what I need to do efficiently, even while you're making other things easier for me. So, Michael, you can chip in if I'm articulating this wrong. I think one, one of the, the key things that we want to achieve, or one of, the, one of the key things that stands out from, you know, like what, what is it that we support? Why aren't we going the route of supporting a headless CMS that talks through an API and so on? Is that we want, you know, one of, one of the key differentiators of or, or pillars of what we are product offering is going to be focused around is, is having you know, your, your content and your code in, in a Git-based repository. That allows you to contribute in whatever way you want, whether it's your local development environment through your editor, whether it's through the web IDE, making multiple file edits right now, or using the static site editor, you know, creating a WYSIWYG edit. I think you, we, you know, I think that we've talked about this in terms of bringing, for instance, editor light into the into the picture in terms of, you know, when you want to edit the raw uh, kind of like uh, markdown source code right there. But I think in terms of the, we mustn't we mustn't forget that we're we're specifically covering one angle of the you know the options that you have to to access and edit your your content and uh, you know the software developer most likely will probably prefer to 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 edit this in their in their local editor especially if they're doing something substantial if it's a small uh, edit you know maybe they're happy to use the the WYSIWYG mode for it but I think if we try and make our static site editor be do everything, it will get too bloated, and it will get uh, you know we, we we run the risk of having a mediocre solution for everybody, and so I think we we have to be clear in terms of you know there's different paths into the source, you know whether it's the web IDE you know, you could you know GitLab it's the product will allow you to, to edit the, the source, you know, in your browser, either through editor light, if you go directly to the file, web IDE, or static site editor, um, or you still have the option of pulling the code locally and editing it like that. So I think from an editing point of view, the software developer is not a, a primary persona that we're targeting for, for um, with the WYSIWYG editing mode. Where, where we do need to keep them in mind is specifically, you know, in the context of the software developer is the one that will potentially create the project, configure the project, you know, make sure that the that all of the the config values are right. Um, and so, and in this specific case where we're dealing around config, they are a relevant uh, persona for us to consider. Okay, uh, I get that, and I. I also get that it's not necessarily related to this issue, but in terms of it being lovable, like a, a lot of software developers are going to use GitLab. That's a common persona. And I, even if there are other editor options, uh, if we have a lovable product from a WYSIWYG experience, uh, it's like, I may want to use that for 90% of the time, but if I just want to drop down and edit the source, 
it would be not lovable to be forced to, to stop or drop that MR or commit it and do something more efficient to go one to use one of the other editors or clone the thing locally and go through a lot of extra hoops just because uh, you didn't let me access the raw source. But that's definitely yeah. a discussion so, for another issue on another day. And I, and I think we, we, we really- not Michael, I'm, I'm, I'm muted too. Oh, sorry, Michael, go for it. Uh, I was gonna throw in my two cents. And uh, in the call yesterday, you did allude to this where, you know, whether we're removing the like raw markdown view or not. And that, you know, we have been talking about editor light. And I think having the static site editor is like one way to edit, but we should provide a way to get to the raw source. If you want to edit that thing, how we do that, that's a bigger question, but yeah. Definitely, you know, there are, we don't want to get into this situation where Slack got into where they introduced this like fancy WYSIWYG editor, but then it pissed off the rest of um, the established kind of uh, user base where they're used to the actions. And then now it's like an all or nothing kind of mode in Slack where you can only do like a markdown mode or do the, what you see is what you get, but you can't do both. And that's so exactly that's the a, situation I'm talking about. And yeah. it, it, it's really frustrating, for example, to not be able to make a proper link or to not be able to easily do that. And there's, I have to go through a bunch of hoops, like change my configuration in a obscure place to switch back and forth. And that's really, you know, frustrating. So I'm, yeah. I'm hoping that's what we avoid. Yeah. Yeah, I, w yeah, I would rather, sorry, go Michael. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, so I would rather us cover eighty percent of our target audience really well, and and get that right. And yes, when we get to the more mature levels of our maturity, um, focus on on the education. You know, if if we look at the the feedback we've received from team members so far, it has been the non-engineering ones who have said. Oh my word, this is so much easier. This is so much better. Yeah. And we're gonna get probably 80% of our value optimizing for for those people. Um, and I don't and I think specifically tailoring for the for the software engineer persona in the WYSIWYG editor and making you know, that way we're gonna have to have a lot of hard work, potentially for a very low reward. Um, you know, thinking of things like markdown shortcuts, if that's something we have to custom uh, develop, you know, where you type in, you know, where you can still write in, in, in kind of like markdown, but it, in the WYSIWYG mode and it, you know, like that, that's tricky. You know, there's a lot of edge cases in something like that. Um, you know, the, the burden or the, the maintenance and, uh, and cost of, of having a source editor uh, for, you know, for a long period of time because in, anything we do, we need to make sure it works in WYSIWYG and source um, you know, right now. So I think considering where we are, I'm comfortable with the fact that we're not focusing on the software developer persona from the editing point of view. Uh, I think we, we mustn't forget about them and we definitely shouldn't give them, uh, gosh, what is the, the right word? Who is gonna say half hour solution for, for you know that that kind of like you know you the slack example where you think that's what they want but it's you know it's actually not really what they need and desire so um i i have something to add before uh moving on into the actual topic that um part of the reasons that that i asked the question in yesterday meeting about um keeping the front matter in the in the resource um was exactly that point the the technical cost that implies uh, synchronizing the raw markdown mode with the we see with tools that we are providing to edit the front matter. Um, that's not the main driving point for for software development uh, for developing the, this product, right? Like our our main priority is like to provide the best experience. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight that um, there is a there is a cost in in trying to provide. Um, a good experience in both in both sides at the same time, within the same user interface. That's a really good point. The technical cost. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank. Thanks for discussing it.
I guess uh, my main concern is like we're going to have the best WYSIWYG experience. And like when you say to use one of these other options, for example, that that isn't going to render the images properly, that isn't going to know where they are, it's not really going to look like that. And the the only way you're going to know for sure is to like deploy it and wait for a review app. That's that's a frustrating experience. But on you know, on the other hand, uh, I get the 80-20 rule, but hopefully we can keep in mind to not lock ourselves into decisions that are going to make it harder to meet that 20% down the road, like not have any ability to, to raw edit and have to redesign, do major redesigns to add that in the future. Thanks for discussing. All right. Um, getting a bit... Uh, back on track here what, one of the thoughts i have right now is we don't actually have an epic related to uh configuration for the static site editor and i almost feel like what we're talking about here is is very uh you know high level uh, you know and because there's going to be different kind of like iterations of of introducing the configuration file um i i spoke with chad yesterday and, and i mentioned you know, like i would imagine the first iteration is just have the file there and read the, the values and pass it to the editor. Don't worry about validating it, checking it or anything like that. You know, just take it, pass it. And, you know, second iteration is, okay, let's introduce some validation checks and stuff. Um, any thoughts in terms of kind of like, uh, kind of like promoting this to an epic and then having kind of like uh, specific iteration issues for, for the various iterations? My thoughts on the configuration in general are that the implementation of how it actually works and uh, passing along configuration to the front end, that's pretty straightforward. It's some plumbing, but that's not the main risk I see. The main risk I see is the, the thought that goes into the configuration values, what they are, what they're named, and how those evolve and what deprecation uh, strategies will have to go through as uh, it becomes used more, especially by people outside of GitLab. And like putting a lot of thought into what, what those are going to be up front so we don't have to deprecate a lot of stuff and go through those hoops and, and cause people frustration, I think is the biggest concern around the config. All right. I am promoting this to an epic because uh, I just feel like we need a parent uh, container discussing the configuration for the static site editor. You know, our users, our goal is that a user should be able to create the editor. You know, we, we discussed in the R&D issue, Chad made a proposal that we, uh, based on present set by other features that we use, uh, the .gitlab folder and have a static site editor YAML file there. Un unlike the GitLab CI uh, configuration file that lies in the root of the project. Um, Along the lines yeah. I was saying, perhaps we should have an issue which is to come up with some documented standards of at, at least what conventions we follow. Like, do we use dashes or camel case? Uh, is it like a noun verb type of thing, like to try to ensure we're at least as, as consistent as we can be, even though we can't predict everything. And part of that would probably involve researching the other existing config files. I think there's at least two or three in GitLab to ensure that we're consistent with those. All right, so we could have an issue for research and document the standards for GitLab feature configuration files. Why is this so much so bad? Uh, Search for dev dev dev. No, it's oh, in dev product. Dev. Yeah, right. Yeah. Why? I can't just give me what I want. All right, so there's one. I think the the. Uh, after kind of like having that standards, you know, that will inform a whole bunch of stuff and might lead to us refining our 
our epic level description and, and so on is I would say we'd need a, an issue to kind of like um, uh, read and pass uh, configuration values to editor. Uh, Oops, I'm about to use that. Um, perhaps we should define uh, an issue to, um, well, perhaps we should first define which are the the first fields uh, that we are going to put in the configuration file, right? Or are we going to discuss that in that in that issue? Well, I, I think you know, <coughs> this, this for me is, is, is more about the plumbing, you know, the putting the plumbing in place of reading and parsing. So I think this isn't, but you make a good point there. Uh, because not only do we need to discuss the, the configuration, we also need to properly document those uh, in our documentation going forward. So that I, I, I do see that as an issue that we should have. Um, so define the configuration, uh, that configuration values or configuration? Well, perhaps we can, we can make it more concrete uh, because yeah. I guess that each uh, configuration field we have its own iteration, right? Yeah. So in our case, we are gonna work with, I think the first ones that we are gonna define are the ones for the, where we are going to upload the images. Okay, define the, the image upload path. Okay, let's get the wording better. Um, introduce configuration value for image upload path, something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. I really wish this project remembered me the last choice. Ah. Um, okay. And then we're is there any other configuration values we we clearly know we need right now? Well, as part of the uh, image upload path, we actually need uh, two configuration values. Uh, we need to know the base uh, path of the of the website in the repository uh, because we need a way of uh, we need a, a base path to resolve the relative URLs. Uh, that are referenced in the markdown uh, documents. And then we need uh, to, uh, the image upload path that is relative to that base path. Sorry, what was that last one you said? Oh, I was just reiterating that that we need the image upload path. I, may, I said that the oh, image okay. upload so, path is relative to, to that base path. Okay. so. The two configuration values we really need is the is the website base path uh, and the image upload path. It, once you know, so essentially, Enrique, once these three issues here at the top, if they're in, if they're kind of like uh, resolved, that unblocks the image upload work. That's right. All right. Okay. Um, so this gives us yeah. a, a good breakdown of uh, what's needed. Let's quickly just kind of like scan here if there's anything further we can define here. Proposal, so introduce a configuration file that is read when a static site URL is requested. We should parse, validate, and transform the configuration file. So here we already know we're going to need a, a future issue for valid, validating the, uh, validate the configuration file uh, values. Um, and we can later on define what that actually means. Yeah, there is possibly one more. I'm not sure yeah. if it's too early to identify that, but do we want to define what kind of static site generator do we use in this configuration? Because it might change the default settings. And if we yes. decide to introduce it later, it might bring us some problems with this migration, but I'm not 100% sure if you should do it now or introduce it later. I wouldn't be opposed to introducing that actually as the first value uh, 
because we know already that our default is middleman and, and mm -hmm. we can have that. Um, and I, I do think, especially as I'm going to, uh, file integrating it with a, with Hugo, uh, soon as well. Um, if there is any specific, uh, kind of like assumptions or things that we need to modify based on the static site generator type, it would be good to have that in there. So I'm, I'm all for defining this now. That's also going to be related to the uh, how the CI uh, build is generated. So I don't know at what point we expect. Uh, like I guess that will be part of the template they pick for the project, which will include the configuration file as well as how the CI file is created to build Hugo versus Middleman, for example. Okay, we should parse, validate, and transform the configuration entries. Now, the transformation, I actually see that re figuring out what we want to do and how we want to pass that to the editor as part of this issue. So I'm, I don't see that as a separate issue. Um, entries in the back end and pass it to the static side editor component on the front end. The back end will only be concerned with the parsing, validation, and transformation of the configuration entries. Further details. So this is the R and D issue, and I think it's worth us just quickly scanning over that, uh, just refreshing our minds in terms of uh, what we define there. So let's go to the CS proposal. So we want to provide more control. Blah blah blah. Introduce this approach has the following environments similar to already implemented configuration files. Yes, YAML format. Blah blah blah. Have path user adds it. A new CI task will check that the, so that's validation. User visits the static site backend reads and validates the content. We've got that backend exposes detected settings to the front end. Front end applies settings to the plugin logic. User sees a different yes. extension of the configuration file. You can add new features. Depending on the feature, they will be either automatically active after the release or available by new con, blah, blah, blah. Data creation of the configuration options. We can decide the feature to upgrade. Yeah possible configuration options. So destination path, yes, we've got that. Configuration of the markdown engine, yeah. Uh, so that could be cram down or common mark or whatever, I guess. Um, what, no, cram down, what's that one? Red carpet, I think is another markdown one. Um, configuration default, return URL. Uh, okay, so this just speaks to post potential configuration options. And I think we'll, what we shouldn't uh, fall trap in is, is going configuration crazy. I think we should introduce new configuration values as the requirement arises. You know, it's important that we get this infrastructure and plumbing there, but let's, let's use the, the, the convention. As soon as we, we make an assumption for users, where we, where we kind of like, okay, we're gonna assume the upload path is this. I think that's the point where we can then introduce a configuration file. Even, even though you don't need to define anything, we allow you to, to def, uh, def, um, define a different value. So edge cases, what if there's no, so this I think is where it's also important for us to, to, to document the default values that we now, uh, that we have in our, in our, in our logic. So, for instance, the, the, the static side generator, the default uh, assumption is that it's middleman. The default assumption for image uploads might be slash images or whatever. So the, I think it's important now that we introduce the, the configuration file that we document these default values that we, you know, if you don't define it, this is what we assume you're, you, you're defining. Um, I, I think that should take the form, I like other projects that do this, that the original template gener generates a file with all of the default values in it and they're documented. There, there's lots of projects do that. And so that's so, sort of a, a self-documenting approach. So you would say that our project template, for instance, that we have should have the default values in a configuration file as right, part of that, that template. Makes it with a comment block above them. And that makes it very discoverable. And then they know exactly where to go to change it without necessarily having to go look at documentation elsewhere. 
I don't know if that's a convention, but I like other projects that do that for their configuration. Okay. I know, well, for example, like uh, Nginx and, and web servers do that a lot. So I can definitely see us now needing an issue to update our middleman static site editor project template to uh, introduce the configuration file and with and have its default values defined by, by default. We already have to revisit that for the, the CI build and other stuff as well. I actually have concern about this one. Uh, I like this approach because it's uh, super visible for users. They don't need to go anywhere. They will see all of the details about the configuration options in the file. But if we decide to add new fields, how user is gonna update their version of the configuration? So really how do we identify these default values? It, it makes deprecation a lot harder. So it's, mm -hmm. we would have to think carefully about it. Yeah. It really depends on how robust the validation is. Like if the validation can, you know, provide a, a really nice error message to say, hey, this, this field is no longer valid, it's changed to this. All right, uh, going back here, uh, what if the has an incorrect format? So there are possible options in this case. So hard failure, warning, um, I, my inclination is that, and, and I think this, this aligns with the validated configuration values uh, issue. My inclination would be to provide a warning and reject any incorrectly defined values uh, and, and to fall back to the default value. Um, but again, you know, we should make that really clear uh, in our error messages to the user, what, we, what, what the impact of them not, uh, having an incorrectly formatted file or you know, inc incorrect value for a key is. That last line is really important. This could be destructive. Like if we fall back to a default, which makes their site like build in completely the wrong way or, you know, misinterpret their markdown, then perhaps these mm. would be two categories, like ones so that will fall back to a default that's safe and others which will just blow up on the build if uh, they were potentially be destructive to fall back to the default. So that, that kind of like, uh, then comes back to the, should we even, because when you, def when you, that makes me wonder whether we should uh, revisit this, this uh, notion of defining or adding the configuration files with predefined values as part of the, the project templates. Maybe we add the configuration file with commented out values not actually defined ones because I would like, you know, I would like to, to believe that we can uh, take the, read some intention from a user that if there is a configuration file and a defined value that, uh, you know, almost we shouldn't be falling back to a default version and, and almost fail hard because for instance, if, if they, if they define the static site generator as Hugo, but for some reason they type it, you go, they misspell you go, you know, that could have catastrophic uh, uh, kind of like, well, not catastrophic, but I mean, it could totally fail in terms of the, the experience. Um, I'm not sure how that's related to whether we have the defaults in the file or not. Like they could well, put in any so value. So for case. me, if, if a, if a static, if a configuration file is provided with, with values defined already, you don't know if that user had intention of defining configuration or not. You just know there's a configuration file with values. Um, whereas if, 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 if they have to specifically create a configuration file to override values, you know, there's more intention behind that action and you, you, know, you can differentiate between whether you, you it's, I guess for me, it's, it's easier to make an assumption of create a hard failure if, uh, if the configuration file then has uh, an incorrect value, I guess, or maybe even not. It's the, the work we would have to do to handle incorrect values and validation and the implications of some of them being destructive. We have to do that regardless of whether we have the defaults mm. in the default file or not. 
Like it, okay. it could get incorrect through any means, whether we have the defaults auto generated or not. All right. So I think a lot of these edge cases is the things that we need to answer in the validation issue. So I'm not going to go into too much detail there. Uh, extra steps, introduction validation step to the deployment process, it will blah, 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 add documentation and describe. Okay. So I feel like, do we need a specific issue for documentation or should we, I think documentation should be part of introducing the individual configuration values. It should be part of the definition of done for these issues. Yeah, if we're, if we're going down the route of having the file auto-generated with the defaults in it, uh, I, I like the approach that the GitLab CI has, like they just have, in many cases, a big example of the file of the, of the default template, which has in line the descriptions. So we could potentially just keep that updated and have some other minimal documentation around it. Okay. Here's my question having a look at, at these various kind of like, uh, you know, let's just kind of like do some sort of uh, a prioritization. Can you, can anybody think of anything more granular we can break this down into for, for iteration's sake. So I, I can't, uh, for the research and document standards, I went ahead and fleshed that out with some topics. People and look at them and see if they agree. We don't have to do it on the call. Topics to cover. Well, we've we've got some time, and I, I think we'll just dedicate today's session to to the configuration. There's enough to cover here. So topics to cover: document existing standards used in other files, although we don't necessarily have to conform to them. But I think it is a good thing to to at least know what the what the standards are. And I would say there if if there isn't something defined in the handbook or at least in the development documentation for GitLab, we should consider adding something there as a proposal um, as part of this. Structure, for example, hierarchical versus flat. What do you mean by that? Um, so it, it's going to be a YAML file, right? So I, I assume so, yes. Right, so there's, like we could try to have a more flat structure. And so like different related values, like uh, image upload path uh, and image upload, uh, okay. image locations could be an array. Like you could instead have like an images key and then under their values, like there, there's choices Okay. And just general uh, philosophies of like whether we want to keep this flat or try to make it hierarchical. Those those are the sort of things to document so people don't have to make that decision going forward. Yeah. Okay. I, I understand what you mean now uh, with that. Uh, keyword naming convention, for example, dash versus camel case. Um, this would be a good one. Like it would be good to also potentially reach out to the technical writing team to get uh, their input on this as well. I'm sure they've been dealing with these things for a lot. Um, and they would probably know if there's inconsistencies with the current uh, configuration files as well. Value conventions, for example, quote strings or not. Okay. Supported value types. So that would be kind of like string value, Boolean numbers, those kind of things. Okay, versioning deprecation strategies. Uh, this is something I'd like to quickly just talk about. Uh, can somebody give me a practical example of where we would need to de deprecate uh, a value? So an, an example would be 
if we had said, okay, there's only going to be one location we could ever um, expect images to be in the source. And so we make that a, a scalar string value top level in the YAML file. And then we say, oh, actually lots of people have their images stored in different directories. That needs to be an array type value. So we have to switch that to an array value and, and uh, that's yeah, so, not necessarily a deprecation because that one could fall back, but there you could think of examples where they're incompatible. So also usually we, changing the, the, the data type of a field is the most common reason. Okay. And would versioning be separate from deprecation or would they be in conjunction with each other? I think it a lot of it is related to our deprecation. I mean, our validation strategy, like whether we, we fall back to reasonable defaults or fail hard, because that's what makes the, the deprecation more painful or not. Like if they're just broken until they fix it or if they can sort of go on. I think related to this would be good to, to link out to GitLab's uh, standard deprecation process and, and standards and strategy that we use. Because I know, I, I believe, I might be speaking under correction, but I believe we only dep uh, remove deprecated things, for instance, uh, with major releases. So when we go from 13 to 14, or 14 to 15 or so. Um, so it'd be good to, to just uh, make sure we align with whatever is defined there. There's lots of examples, like for, for example, in the CI config, there's the changing from dependencies to needs, and they're currently going through a deprecation period on that. Formatting for comment block sections for documenting auto created default entries, assuming you go with the root of auto crank. Explain this. So, what we were just talking about if we do auto generate a, a config file with a template um, and having the documentation be in line for that, uh, you know, what does that look like? Is it sort of squares of, of hashes around it, uh, multi line? Does it have a right side? It just standards like that for. Okay. Uh, default that comments in the file. I think this whole thing should end up in an MR that uh, puts a, you know, standardizes this for, for GitLab in, in our documentation. That's really where I think we should land on this because. Yeah, I put that note in the first bullet. Yeah, the fact that we don't have, uh, have this defined to just easily reference means somebody else down the line is going to think of these things as well. And we should definitely do that. Okay. Um, we're coming on time. Anybody have anything else they want to add to, to this conversation? Um, for me, next steps here is I'll go make sure all the labels are, are properly added on these. Um, Chad, you'll be the DRI for fleshing these out. I'll, I'll try and add some kind of like initial, just high level requirements and, and, and so on to them. But I'm gonna, it, it'll be on you to, to flesh these out. Um, I'll make sure they all got all the proper labels and all of those things. Anybody else have any parting thoughts before we end the call? Michael? Nope. Uh, I was just going to say I enjoyed this uh, listening in and uh, seeing how you guys think. Yeah, I I will say I really enjoyed uh, having you all as a sounding board and just talking through this. Um, it was definitely valuable uh, for me personally, and uh, you know I think we've gone and fleshed this out quite a bit uh, better than you know. A lot better than where it was uh, one hour ago or 50 minutes ago. So thank you all for your time um, and uh, have a good day further. Ciao. Oh.